Say with you, Rayma. Say it again. Say, Rayma. I trust that uh, uh, you were here last week because we're going to carry on from where we have left off. And I know it is getting cold, so some people prefer the evening service than the morning service. Uh, are you there? Help me with the sound. Uh, just make it, give it a bit more throat. It feels flat up here. And last week I strained my voice and hurt my throat very bad. So I don't want that again. Please just help me. Um, <clears throat> so, but it is okay now. It is better than last week. Uh, say with me again, church. Say, Rayma. You know, uh, you can know the Word of God. And I know we always put a put an um, emphasis on it. I can know the physical word, which we call the graphe. I can know it from back to end. But unless I have rhema, which is the voice of God, I can have four doors in front of me of job opportunities. And uh, all of them can be good. And I can know the Bible from front to back. But unless I have the voice of God, I won't know which door to enter into. I can know the principles, I can know every good thing, but I won't know what decision to make. Are you guys with me? Say with you the voice of God. Tonight we are getting into uh, the voice of God and the voice of Jezebel. Because there's another voice that, that uh, intimidates and threatens people, many times ministers. And it would th threaten people. It will threaten those usually with uh, success in business. It, the voice will threaten uh, believers. Um, it is one of, we did a demonology advanced course this, this week and we went a whole uh, series on or a whole evening on Jezebel. And a lot of people think Jezebel is just someone dressed in red dress with red lipstick and it can't be further from the truth. She is gender, uh, genderless. It's a spirit that goes to men and to women. But it starts with fiery darts in your head. Are you guys with me? As we touch on the armor, there is fiery darts that come, suggestive thoughts that penetrate somebody's head. And once I allow my God to be down, the shield of faith is something that I keep up that has oil and is oiled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And every time a fiery dart would come against the shield, it has the ability to bounce off because the shield has an elastic effect to it that is oiled with the oil of the Holy Ghost. And the moment I let my God down, fiery darts enter into my head. Suggestive thoughts of the enemy begins to enter my head. And once those thoughts enter into my head, the moment I entertain it, it becomes an image. After it becomes an image, it becomes a reality in my life. After it becomes an image, I begin to speak about it. So it begins to come a thought. After a thought, I'm beginning to see this reality. Then I'm beginning to speak about it to others. I'm beginning to complain. I'm beginning to, or it just is part of my vocabulary. Suddenly it begins to come in and it becomes a reality. Are you guys with me? The same way with the Word of God. If I can hear His voice, His voice will begin to become an image in front of me. Once it becomes an image, because listen, the Bible says that Habakkuk stood on a rampant. Habakkuk, Habakkuk says, I stood on a rampant and looked to see what He has to say for, about me, to me. I had to look to see what God had to say, meaning that God's Word is images. His voice is images. The moment He speaks, it becomes an image in front of me. And I have to have the ability to see what God is saying. Are you guys with me? That is why there's not really a... Um, there's very rarely where God would speak or would come into manifestation like the audible voice of God. What you think is audible is actually your spirit seeing. So it would be so loud of the perception of your spirit seeing something 
and it comes through the organ of perception but you think in the natural it is hearing but it is not hearing it is your spirit simply who perceived by seeing what God has spoken are you guys with me the voice of God and maybe our next series is going to be on the voice I'll see that the how God speaks in many different avenues because a lot of people people go to mediums they go to psychics as I said you can go on TikTok now and you just scroll and all of a sudden you get to a psychic and you think that's bad then you scroll down and you get to a Christian psychic and then you get then you think it gets bad and you scroll one more down and you get to a Christian psychic that's in South Africa you know so uh, that's what I saw so so um, meaning that and, and their live streams have people on you know paying and the one says pay me $35 and I tell you who you're gonna marry you know or if you're uh, so and they're making money and people are paying PayPal meaning they say hunger for his voice for God's voice they might go through it through different avenues that's unbelievers they don't know better but they still require direction and guidance are you guys with me and uh, welcome to those who are online and we're starting directly immediately with uh, with uh, the message this morning but um, say with me his voice without his voice in your life you will walk aimlessly the Bible says where there is no prophetic revelation the people cast off restraint and they lose hope meaning where the prophetic is missing and revelation which is the Word of God being made open, becoming His voice, where it is missing, the people walk around aimlessly. Are you guys with me? You know, uh, our church is very limited by the size of our building. You can only sit a building on a normal Sunday, 70% full, maybe 80. So we have winter affecting, we're sitting about 80% full and uh, well, more than that. Uh, that's why we have to eventually go over to double services but i said i don't want to do it now we'll leave it till till next week that means we'll have an 8 a.m and a 10 a.m service but we'll leave i uh, not till next week till next year uh but we had that before before COVID, and uh but a church would only really sit 70 to 80 percent so uh what is here is not is not half of our church because if you look at a conference will be double this because you have members that will only come once every three weeks and it's because of size so we are uh uh, uh, busy in the process of looking for a building but inflation is so bad um, uh, I was looking at car prices yesterday because we only have one car and I was looking at car prices and I was like did I like miss a decade here or something <laughs> you know uh, the last time I remember a BMW was like 300,000 rand for a three series and now it's like a three-year-old one is like 500,000 rand and uh, I was just so upset, I just, I just quit. Um, <laughs> really. Um, uh, uh, because, uh, so you have inflation. Inflation is basically invisible. Um, it's the invisible enemy in your finances. And, uh, you know, before you know it, things are so expensive. Your salary stays the same. Your amount of money stays the same but it's purchasing power is being lost and you and you uh so you know what you used to maybe we could have maybe built a building for 35 million 40 million we are now looking at nothing less than 85 million in south africa yet people are getting the same salaries uh most of them and uh, uh unfortunately that, that is inflation so we're sitting in a situation where you have inflation plus interest rates plus uh, uh, the great uh, um, resignation, plus a lot of other things which they're determining is going to, is lining up with the Great Depression and uh, equal to, I don't know when it was, 1929 or somewhere around then. And um, they putting it synonymously with that. But, uh, you know, that is why we are so strict on finances to make let people budget. To, a lot of people think we're just making people poor. You know, a lot of people, we have more testimonies in the church uh, of people. In fact, 80% of our testimonies is financial blessings. 
Um, we want to see healings and we do see healings and deliverance. We see all those things in the prophetic, but it all comes back to when people would say, you know, I had a revelation of tithing or I had a revelation of giving. And uh, once you make God, a, once you become a steward of your finances, God is obligated to bless you. It becomes an obligation for Him. Are you guys with me? And uh, 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 so, so, because of inflation, we have this. So now we're looking at 85 million, but the vision still stands and we, will, we shall accomplish it. I don't know how, but uh, if it... We are actually very well on track. It's just I hate losing money in this place here uh, where we are losing money because as inflation goes, we're paying, we're going to be paying 200,000. Well, we're paying close to, close to, I think we're like, I think we're about 190 or something like that, 190,000. Um, by next year, we're going to be over 200,000 uh, for this place rental year. Um, think of it, rental, to over 200,000 just year. And, uh, you know, then we own Kruger's Dorp that can sit the same amount. So it is, it is, uh, it is, um, it is, uh, it is ridiculous. So, uh, but that is why I want you to listen to or get into the specifics of the voice of God. Go with me, put on the screen for me, Matthew chapter number four, verse four. And we're going to kick off where we ended last, last uh, week and I'll, 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 uh, I'll go and touch on that just now, just to, um, just to uh, go through with what we said last week within like two or three minutes. But listen to this. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, so with the words, that proceeds from the mouth of God. So you have in this one verse, you have Logos, Rhema, and something else that I'm going to touch on now. So you have Logos where he says, it is written. Are you guys with me? Although we know the written word of God actually is graphe, which is, uh, uh, so this written here, a lot of preachers preach that the written word is Logos. And it is actually not. And I just want to, let me just recap. So you have the graphe. The graphe is the black on white. Logos is the understanding of the black on white. Logos is Jesus himself who came. So graphe is the written word. Jesus is the living word, Logos. And then rhema, so with the rhema, is the spoken word. That is when it comes out of God's mouth. And it comes out of your mouth. It becomes rhema, which we call a double-edged sword. Are you guys with me? So this is graphe. The opening up of the graphe, reading it and understanding, or sitting in a service like this, is the graphe becoming logos. You begin to receive an understanding of graphe. Then once you receive an understanding, the Spirit of God can begin to breathe on it and cause rhema to come forth. What is Rhema? Rhema is when you hear the voice of God for a specific purpose, for a specific mission and intent in your life for a specific moment, for an appointed time. Are you guys with me? So he says, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word. Say with the word. So the word word there is Rhema. But by every Rhema that proceeds from the mouth, so with the mouth, the word mouth is stoma, out of the stoma of God. So it is like this, but he has answered and said, it is logos. It is an understanding. He says, I have an understanding of the written words. I am the understanding. I am the logos when it comes to Jesus. It is logos that a man shall not live by bread alone. But by every rhema that proceeds from the stoma of God. Are you guys with me? So go with me to Hebrews 4 verse. I'll explain stoma now. Go with you to Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God 
is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the two-edged sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So with the thoughts and intents of the heart. So he says the word of God, which is the Logos word. And here we also misinterpret it. We always said, but you know, for the word of God and we believe it is this word. No, this is the graphe. I can, I can tear this book up and guess what? Nothing will happen. I won't die. Uh, a lot of people take this book. A lot of people misunderstand prayer. They put prayer as a ritual. They take this book and they put it in their house. And they say, uh, you're by the front door, or you know, family Bible. And that protects the house. Some people take the book and lie next to their bed and they say it's protection. They mean well, but it's nothing less than witchcraft. They wear a cross or they have a little statue of the Ark of the Covenant in their office or another one of the menorah or a, my best ever, a shofar. Okay. And uh, they think that there is power in that. There's no power in that. That is witchcraft. The moment you put your trust in an object, it is witchcraft. We are now in the New Testament where the, the temple is no longer built by hands, human hands, but it is built by the hands of God. Are you guys with me? The only symbolic, two symbolic things in the New Testament is the oil and the communion. But in itself, it has no power. It is symbolic. But virtue of our understanding, by our logos of it, the same way this is a graphe, it has no power unless it becomes the logos. Once it becomes the logos, it means that we now get an understanding of the graphe. And once we get an understanding, it is then, say with me, living and powerful. And it is sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, meaning it now has the ability to deal with invisible forces, to deal with things that are invisible, to deal with the intents of people's hearts, to so with spirit and soul. Are you guys with me? Bone and marrow, meaning it goes right into the bodily sicknesses of people. Have your seats. And it is a discerner of the thoughts of the Lord. That's why Jesus could walk. And he could say, he could walk and the Pharisees would think something in their hearts. And when you see people leaving, that's just our guys going for Kruger's door. Uh, so they would, they would, Jesus would walk and the Bible says that the Pharisees would begin to, you see, they would go early so they don't have to speed. I go late, so we have to, okay. So, um, and I don't have a car, so if, if Rocher backslides, then we have a problem. Uh, okay, so where, where was I now? When Jesus was to the Pharisees, would just think something in their heart. And Jesus would answer them on it. Why? He's the Logos, the discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. No devil can read your mind. But the Spirit of God in someone can read your heart. Usually prophets around a person would read somebody's heart. Your heart is not your mind. Are you guys with me? So no one can read your thoughts. There's no, no mentalist, no demon, nothing can read your thoughts. But the Spirit of God in somebody or the Logos, the graphite that has become an understanding, that has become the Logos, can discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Meaning you'll be able to do a business deal and shake the hands of someone and you'll be able to discern what is going on in their heart. What is happening in their heart? 
Are you guys with me? Logos is powerful. It says, living and sharp, a living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the two-edged sword, piercing even to the division. So the logos pierces you. Are you guys with me? But there's something that Rhema does. It says logos is sharper than any two-edged sword. But go there to, to, to Revelation 1 verse 16. This logos is sharper, but it needs to be used in a way for it to become the rhema. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth. When, uh, out of his mouth, uh, sorry, he, he, had, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the signing of the sun. Are you guys with me? Go with me to... Uh, Go with me to back to Matthew 4 verse 4. And I'm just jumping a bit around, but I want you to catch, we already started with this message uh, last week. I want you to catch the significance of Rhema. And then we touch, we're getting, uh, and that'll be the closure of the seventh weapon, which is the javelin of prayer. Not mentioned in scripture, or mentioned, uh, alluded to, but not very clear and a lot of people miss it when they when they discuss the armor so listen to this but he answered and said it is written and it's probably one of the most important weapons but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God then we go to John 6 go to John 6 verse 63 John 6 verse 63 it is the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So he says, I shall not live on bread alone, but by every word, every rhema that proceeds out of the stoma of God. So we see that logos is a double-edged sword. Are you guys with me? Piercing the person. But once I get and I touch on Rhema, it is now a double-edged sword that pierces the enemy. It is a word given to me for a certain situation that is inspired. I read the graphe, I get an understanding, a logos, and then all of a sudden, a word jumps off the page and it becomes a Rhema to me. For example, we are looking for land in Centurion. Or we are battling to get land or for the prices and so on. And then all of a sudden, everything I'm reading in the Logos, in the Graphe, I get it, I have a Logos of it. Now, all, the only sentences that is standing out for me is that I have promised you this land there. I shall give you this land. I will take you into the land of the promise of, your, of Canaan. I shall take you into the land of there. And all of a sudden, everything I'm reading has the word land to it. And then I realize 80% of the promises of God in the Old Testament is connected to land. Now, what do I have? I have been given a rhema from God to come forth out of my mouth. But it is not a rhema to fulfillment or completion unless it leaves my mouth. Once it leaves God's mouth, nothing happens. But when it leaves my, leaves my mouth, it becomes a double edged. The word double edged means two mouthed words. Are you guys with me? Have your seats. Have your seats. The word double edged in the Greek means two mouthed. It leaves God's mouth and then it has to leave my mouth. I have to have a keen ability to hear and discern the voice of God and then speak forth what God is saying in order for a situation to change. So the Lord will see, but wait, okay, we have, we need land or we have a situation with land. There might be some resistance. There might be this, there might be enemies. Listen, when the children of Israel were given Canaan, the enemy was still on it. Yet God said, it is yours. I don't know if you understand. When Abraham had no children, God came and said to him, change your name to Abraham. 
father of many uh, 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 Sarai I think it means mother or queen of many so listen in in the in the uh, in that culture a name was everything when you would speak someone's name it had a meaning to it and it would like you would be speaking that meaning so when it says it means father of many in our English context it's like me calling Kalelo I would say father of many can you do this and that would be connected to his destiny and who he is as a person yet everybody around them knew they couldn't have children they are 90 years old or 1990 they couldn't have children are you guys with me Sarah couldn't have children yet all of a sudden they changed their own name by what God has pronounced and said but yet the manifestation was not there it is called faith so he says so Abraham, Abraham begins to call himself Abraham and, and Sarai begins to call herself Sarah. So they go around and say, we are father of many, queen and mother of many. And people are looking and thinking, but are you silly? There's nothing around you. Maybe your religion has gone to your head or you've become mad that you would think you, will have, you have many children. Why are you speaking so foolishly? Are you guys with me? So, Abraham became a friend of God because of his faith and he believed and he became the righteousness of God. But he believed what, what God was saying without there being results. So, he heard God, nothing was happening. He began to change his own name, which means that he spoke and completely uh, and, and, and continually spoke or repeated what God has said. Because it cannot become a double-edged sword unless I speak and I say what God has said. Ezekiel was prophesying and the Lord said to him, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he said, you know, Lord. And the Bible says that the Lord said, tell these bones, prophesy that they will live and sinew will come upon and flesh will come upon them. And as God said everything, nothing happened. Because it is by prayer and by our mouths that we give heaven permission to be on earth. But now please, I need to put this in balance. It doesn't mean that we, that God cannot do anything without us. He is... Uh, he is omnipotent, omniscient, and uh, omnipresent. Are you guys with me? He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere at the same time. So we don't take that aspect away from Him. But what is prayer? It is reminding God or giving God permission to do what He has already promised to do in His Word. It is a reminder of God, reminding to God, throwing His word back at Him. The Bible says, no word shall leave the mouth of God without it returning void. Meaning it has to return, but it cannot return empty. It has to be full of something. What? The fulfillment of that word coming to pass. I think it's Isaiah 55. The fulfillment of that word coming to pass has to come back to Him. So what is He waiting for? God speaks. He's waiting for somebody to begin to speak it, to fulfill it. But as they speak it, that word goes back to Him in fulfillment. Are you guys with me? Which means that He has given land, although the enemy is still on it. The enemy thinks it belongs to them. Are you guys with me? And it looks to everybody that that is not yours. But God said. You might say, but I'll never have this business. But the scripture just popped up out of the Bible. And it made sense to me to say that the silver and the gold belongs to you. Or I'm going to give you a business. like, And you see some story of a scripture of business related. And everything in your spirit says every night when you go to bed, you will have a business. You will have a business. 
yet you are employed by a minimum wage job somewhere and not getting any money and you begin to walk around and tell people I will have a business it's going to be this big or you tell them I have a business because they don't understand the concept that it is manifest in the realm of the spirits but it needs an organ to come into this realm here which we call stoma say with me stoma have your seats have your seats Thanks. So with this stoma, the word stoma, so remember the word rhema means double-edged sword, two-mouthed word. It's a word that requires two mouths to be spoken through. Then it says, Matthew 4 verse 4 says, I shall not live, not live by bread alone, but by every word, every rhema that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The moment you get revelation, your mouth, your stoma has to speak it forth. Not just study and prepare it or read about it and think about it. It has to leave the organ of your mouth, organ called your mouth. We are the only, I don't want to say animal, we are the only creature, creation of God that has a mouth to articulate and have a vocabulary to speak with intelligible uh, words. Are you guys with me? Intelligible communication. No other creature, no other creation of God lower than us, except for angels that, are, that, that, that is another realm, but on this earth is able to do that. Which means it's the organ that brings something from the spirit into the natural. What did he say to Adam? He said, Adam, speak and name the animals. Call them forth, which in the Hebrew means to call them forth into existence. So the moment God would bring an elephant, a dead elephant, in front of Adam, Adam would use his organ called stoma, and he would speak, and the animal would come to life. And we've taught this in our global school of ministry and everywhere we preach that in the you need to understand the book of genesis in that nature of uh of what it was written in which is the hebrew language that god would bring the animals and the moment adam would speak it means to call them forth they would come forth into existence he had the ability to use his mouth to bring something from the spirit into the night. You see, we just think that he had to name them. No, he called them forth. Because God wanted to say, the creative ability that I have, I've put it in you. We are not God that can create something out of nothing. That is why he, God created the animals. But he allowed Adam to call them forth. So God creates a business for you. But it requires you to call it forth. Or he has required wealth for you, or a ministry for you, or a relationship for you. But he requires you to call it forth. Are you guys with me? Uh, the word stoma means this in the Hebrew. Or in the, in the Greek, sorry. In the Greek, stoma means this. It means the edge of a sword, or the edge of a weapon, or the edge of a knife. Meaning that Revelation 1 verse 16, go Revelation 1 verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth. So the out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Out of your mouth, which is the edge of the sword, the edge of a knife. Meaning you use your mouth to begin to cut things. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The Logos has the ability to cut things. The Bible says, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Logos is sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing. So the Logos pierces you. 
but the rhema pierces the enemy. So every situation that you have, God gives you a rhema. But you have to graduate from the graphe to the logos, from the logos to the rhema. Are you guys with me? Because if I don't have the graphe, I cannot have the logos. If I don't have the graphe, I cannot have an understanding of the graphe. So I need to get into this word. And it has to become a part of me. Once that has happened, I can sit in a church service like this and I can now receive the understanding. Or I can in my devotion begin to under get the understanding. The moment I get the understanding, rhema comes forth. A lot of people try to get rhema without this word and it's witchcraft. If God says to me or says to somebody here, uh, you know, a lot of people will come to us and say, God said I must marry that one. Let's say it's a young person. And then we're like, okay. Um, and then you find out later, but that person is not even a believer. Or God will never contradict His word. We're like, okay, no, but others have gotten married like this. And both of them are saved. That is damage control. And you can never be assured that that will happen. Are you guys with me? Hmm. So say with the lo say with the graphe, say logos, say rhema, say stoma. All of those words go together. It is the ability to bring the invisible realm into the visible, to bring the spiritual into the natural. Are you guys with me? So what is prayer? Let's go to Ephesians 6 verse 18. So I've got about, uh, we got a bit of time. Read me from verse 13, uh, go through from verse 13 first. I'll go verse 10. I want to see something there. I want you to see this. As I said, we kind of like touched on the armor, but not all the pieces, just really pieces that I feel is beneficial for, for warfare for now. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor. So the whole armor of God that you may be able, listen to this. Now in the mornings we teach, in the evenings we preach and minister to you. So in the evenings I'm, we're going to be ministering. I'm here tonight, I think five o'clock and we're going to touch and get into the voice of God and the voice of Jezebel. But that's where we minister to people in the morning. We don't have much time. We want to get the word to you in a teaching manner. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able may be able there are some that are able to stand others that cannot stand that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil next verse for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities powers against rulers of darkness and against spiritual weakness in heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor he says the second time all armor of god that you may be able to withstand say with me to withstand so some are able to stand some are not some are able to withstand some are not that you may be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand meaning there's an evil day that is coming upon everyone that is here mm. And he says, the only way you can overcome it is by putting on the armor. But we have this perception of like, I must wake up in the morning and I might say, blessed bread of righteousness, come on me. This one, come on me, that, and then I'm ready for my day. Some people sing a little song and then they, uh, they believe they are ready for their day. Pentecostals used to do it back in the day. Okay. And uh, that's not what it means. There's no such thing as the armor. Paul was just using an analogy to explain truths that we have to have on us. Ah. I'll just get into trouble if I have to make the, uh, if I have to make the uh, subtitle of the sermon to say there's no such thing as the armor. That would be just provoking, but there is no such thing as armor. Paul was taking a soldier and using an analogy that people could understand that day to say this is how important righteousness is to you and if we look in the old testament it speaks of like the righteousness will come on you like a breastplate and salvation is as important as a helmet because it protects your very life and your mind 
if somebody goes for the head and cuts off the head, the person is dead. So he says salvation is like a helmet. And then he goes to the shield and the sword. But he was using an analogy. It's not now armor pieces and a person, and people get it completely weird and wrong. These are truths. If you don't, you can say, I put the breastplate on till you blew in the face. But if you don't understand the righteousness of God in Christ, there'll be no breastplate on you. Are you guys with me? If you don't understand peace, but you say, I'm putting on the shoes, you'll have no understanding. That peace, when you put on the shoes, it gives you the ability to stand strong and to stand sure where you're not swayed by anything, but you are firmly planted, which gives you, because as I said, I believe it was uh, last week, that the shoes of peace, it's shoes of peace, yet it has spikes under that goes like this. Eight inches or 18 inches something spikes. That it was used to walk for two things, to walk and stand fast in battle, but also to crush the enemy as you were walking and to use it in battle. Many of them would use and lift up the foot and kick the enemy with those sharp things. Are you guys with me? And this is where we get the scripture where it says, I will crush Satan shortly under your feet. It doesn't say under my feet. God is saying under your feet. I will crush Satan shortly. What under your feet? Under the shoes of peace that is armed with spikes. I will crush the head of Satan. But what is peace? Meaning I cannot fight this battle without the realm and the dimension of peace. It is a realm that is governed by the Prince of Peace. That it doesn't matter what's going on around you. Everything can fall to pieces. You have the peace of God in you. You just know that you know that everything is perfect. Everything, it's like it can be inflation. It can be uh, everything around you can, can rise. Are you guys with the interest rates can spike? This one can be sick. This can happen. No jobs. People can lose their jobs here, but you have the peace of God. Meaning that the battle is not yours, but it is God's. Once you understand how to enter this battle with the realm of the Spirit, David said to Goliath, I'm not coming to you with a weapon or a spear or a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Because Goliath said to him, I will take and swear by the birds of the air and by my gods that I come to you right now. Meaning Goliath went to witchcraft. David went to the Lord, the one he had covenant with. It doesn't matter how big your battles are. Say with me, peace is what shakes the enemy. Have your seats, have your seats. Peace is one of the most powerful ways to fight a battle. You are not shaken. The enemy knows when you're shaken inside or not. Are you guys with me? So where, where, where were we? Go Ephesians, where we were, 6 verse 13. Say with me, evil day. So every one of us are going to have an evil day. There's a day where everything is going to go chaotic. Are you guys with me? An evil day is when everything falls apart. Next verse. Stand there for having good at your waist. And uh, here it goes into the armor. Go through to verse 18. To the different pieces of armor. Verse 18 speaks of the sword of the Spirit. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Say with me. Uh, go back, go back. So go through verse 17, sorry. Verse 17, listen to this. So it says, the sword of the Spirit, which we have dealt with last week, which is the Word of God. This week we're dealing, and it goes on, verse 18. Now we get to the seventh weapon. It says, praying always. So with you, praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I want to work on three things here. Praying always. I want to work with prayer. What is prayer? Number two, praying always. What does that mean? And prayer in the Spirit. Are you guys with me? Three things that stands out here. So listen, what is prayer? A lot of us think it is a ritual where we sit at our bed and we say thank you for everything that has happened today. Some people sit before they eat and they uh, say a little prayer. 
um, that's all religion and it's rituals. Some people think prayer is praying to God what they want only um, in their own selfish desires. That's not prayer. Prayer is number one, reminding God of what He has already said and legalizing heaven to come and interfere in earth's demands. Are you guys with me? So prayer, some people think prayer is a habit, yet it is earthly permission for a heavenly interference. It is the ability to get on my knees and say, the word of God says this, the Logos says this, the rhema to me says this. So God, I'm reminding you and I'm throwing the word back at you as you have given it to me. I'm giving it back at you. Meaning when God spoke to the bones, uh, to Ezekiel about the bones, nothing happened to the bones. Unless Ezekiel had a keen ear to ear and repeat what God has said. And the moment he repeated what God has said, the bones begin to manifest. And the Bible says there was a sound and a coming together and life began to enter them. And once all everything was done, it was a mighty army that was standing. But nothing was fulfilling or nothing started happening unless Ezekiel opened his mouth and began to speak. So the word of God is as powerful in your mouth as it is in God's mouth. I'm gonna say it again. The word of God is as, as powerful in your mouth as it is in God's mouth. When he said, let there be light, he has given you the ability to create as well, to bring something from the spiritual into the natural. But it has to be something that is in his word that he has already promised you. It is our responsibility to do it. He said to, he said to the children of Israel, he said to Moses, I've given you the promised land. Yet they have, were not even in the promised land. So God is saying, I've given you that business. Yet you are so far away from it. You're employed a minimum wage and God is saying, but it's yours. I've given it to you. It is your responsibility. I've given you that ministry. You can be 18 years old and nobody can believe in you. But yet you've had some voice of God coming to you at some point in time that said, I will call you as a great evangelist or a prophet or a minister. So all you have is God said. Listen, have your seats. I'm going to touch, we're going to get tonight in the voice of Jezebel. A lot of people are where they are today, missed everything in their lives because they missed the voice of God. Um, how can I say it? People ask me all the time. They say, how do we get our ministry right? We have, let's say, Centurion, Krugersdorp, Cape Town, United States. How do we get our ministry right? The blessing of finances that we have. Uh, but now with inflation, it doesn't look to me like that anymore. But it used to look good when I was under the impression that things were still as it was 10 years ago. Um, but people ask us all the time, how do we get these things right? And they're like, you know, you must be so good. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking there is nothing that I have done. There's nothing that I have done in my own ability. There's nothing I've done in my own strength. There's no special gift that God has given me. Yeah, He's called, us, called me as a prophet. He is, there are some gifts, but there's nothing for me that can say that oh, it's because of that that this ministry is like that, except for two things, by the grace of God. And number two, that when God spoke, I was obedient. That is it. I had the ability to just discern His voice, hear it, and run after it. Where others were deceived and didn't hear His voice, but heard the voice of Jezebel, and ran off to that because Jezebel is cloaked in a religious voice. Jezebel is cloaked in the voice of God. Masked in a voice that sounds like God. And will come to you not to destroy you, but to divert your destiny. It knows and she knows that you are committed. She knows that you are persistent. And she knows you work hard, will do everything to get to a goal. So what does she do? She gives you another goal. She gives you another dream. And all of a sudden you end up 40, 50, 
55, don't see a manifestation yet, and you begin to self-condemn you and you think, but you don't have gifts or this or no, 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 no. There was just a voice that diverted. That's why I'm saying, say with you, the voice of God is very important. So what is prayer? It is calling on God to intervene in ways that he has already declared in his words. Are you guys with me? Let me go to, I want to read you a story. I want to say, or explain the context or the process of how we do this. 1 Kings 18 verse 1, just before we run out of time, I want to give you these two stories. 1 Kings 18 verse 1. Put it on the screen for me. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. That the word of the Lord, so that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. The rhema came to Elijah. In the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. This was before Elijah began to pray for rain. He had a word from God telling him I will send rain so Elijah had a legal position to stand in he had substance or a documentation to refer to where God has spoken you see if anything wants to take out the ministry or anybody wants to question me I can say God said one two three the voice of God has said and because he has spoken it gives us a double-edged sword to fight this enemy with are you guys with me? That the Bible says that in 4 verse 12, Hebrews 4 verse 12, nothing stands in the way of the sword. Division of soul and spirit, thoughts and intents of the hearts, bone and marrow, nothing stands. It divides everything. Are you guys with me? You look unsaved in the winter. You look depressed. Okay. This winter is not as cold as the other ones. Um, one case, so listen, so Elijah had Ramah. Now go with me to verse 41, 18 verse 41. Listen to this. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went up, eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Elijah had a rhema word before he began to speak it. He wasn't a Christian that says, I will have and I declare, I name it, claim it, frame it. I shall have a Ferrari. I will have a 10 bedroom mansion house. Yet God never said any of it. That's witchcraft. Are you guys with me? So I have to have the understanding of the word. Then it has to jump out. I will bless you with lands and properties. I will bless you with servants. And the moment it becomes rhema to you, you now have the ability to begin to speak it relative to what God has for your life. Are you guys with me? I know you don't like it. I know people prefer Tony Robbins. Uh, motivational speaking. That's what most preachers do today. One preacher said, one very famous preacher, and I'm not yet to speak against preachers, one very famous one, very big church. He was interviewed by, I think it was the BBC, or something, or uh, um, 60 seconds or 60 minutes or something like that. Um, he was interviewed by them and they asked him, they said, but look, you write all these books, but we don't see any scripture in it or even Jesus in it. And this is a preacher that had full stadiums. So he was like, so now you have an unbeliever saying, we see you writing these books, but we don't see scripture in it or mentioning the name of Jesus. So he's like, uh, 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 uh. he's like, no, 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 you know, God has called me to really just encourage and motivate people. And he said, I don't prefer to be called pastor. And listen, 
when people say titles, 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 get away with, the, get over your carnal thinking. It is not a title. It is a gift that is given by Jesus Christ, an extension gift of His. To be called a pastor is not the same as a doctor. A lot of people like to use doctor and understand it. That is for man's eyes. But a doctor in the eyes of God means squat. It is apostle, evangelist, prophet, teacher, pastor. It is extension gifts, part of Christ that is put into a person. Oh my God, you need to be so proud to say that I've been given a part of Christ. He has called me to full-time ministry. I've been given a part of Christ to extend his work and the kingdom. It's not a title. Are you guys with me? So I appreciate those who are doctors and even in theology, those who are with doctor, doctorates and etc. But it doesn't stand anything before God. That is just to get favor in the eyes of man. That is carnal. That's why some preachers use the phrase doctor. That's just to, for them to they use wisdom. That's all. They use wisdom. But it, in, in God, it doesn't mean anything. And pastor, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher is not a title. It is a gift and it is a name. Jesus the Christ. What was his title? The anointed one. The Christ. That was his function and his name and his gift. Okay. Are you guys with me? So, 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 let's go to, let's jump for me to, 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 where are we? Uh, Ephesians 6 verse 18. I need to, I need to finish this. And then we need to speed. Because the service is already starting in KDP. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So they're praying always. Now people take this thing and say, okay, you know, I need to pray under my breath. I need to, uh, like Smith Wigglesworth says, no, I don't pray long but I don't go 30 minutes without praying and we get this false perception that we have to pray always yet the words say always is the word time and in time you have two Greek words chronos and kairos chronos is an earthly time word meaning that chronos basically means this I'm going to meet you sometime tomorrow that's what chronos means but kairos is God's time but it also means an appointed time appointed date a season, a specific occasion, specific set time. And always here means kairos, meaning that at appointed specific times, I want you to pray. But this is in relation to the evil day. Are you guys with me? Meaning that God is saying, listen, at an appointed time, suddenly there will be a moment in your life or throughout as you go, maybe this week, suddenly there comes an unction on you. Or you're on an evil day, you're fighting something, there comes an unction on you. Just to immediately begin to pray for a situation. He says, in that moment, I want you to pray. And then we look at the seventh weapon, which is prayer, which is the javelin of prayer in the Roman soldier's outfit. It meaning that none of the other pieces of armor can come together or work efficiently without the javelin of prayer. Righteousness can only come on to the degree that I understand prayer. Not prayer as in works, but prayer as in my relationship with God. Prayer as in bringing heaven into earth's interference, interfering into earth's earthly affairs. Reminding God of what He has already said. Are you guys with me? So Kairos is this, uh, sorry, Kronos is I'll meet you sometime tomorrow. But Kairos is tomorrow 2.30, I'm going to meet you there at that restaurant. So the word is saying here, at a specific set time, you will find that you have to pray. Are you guys with me? So go with me to, go with you to Daniel chapter number 9 verse 2. Daniel chapter number 9 verse 2. I'll we'll close off with this. I just want to get this through. Listen to this. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified. The number of the years. That's why we are very specific when it comes to certain meanings of certain numbers. I understood by the books of the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah. The prophet are you guys with me these people 
and some pastors or some people tell you don't read anything except the Bible they talk nonsense Daniel was a prophet and he learned from other prophets that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem then I set my face towards the Lord of God the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting sackcloth and ashes listen Number one, Daniel discovered and looked for what God has said in the graphe. Then once he have done that, he got an understanding and realized, but wait, we are in that time right now that Jeremiah prophesied over. Now it became the Logos. As it became the Logos, he went to God and he began to pray for that situation because he had a word that became a Logos and then it was prophesied, it became a rhema to him and he had the ability to take God's voice and words and go and pray about the situation. Go with you to verse 20. Same chapter, verse 20. Now while I was speaking, Praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people as well and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, whom I have seen in a vision in the beginning. I'll leave that one not for today, for another time. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Meaning Daniel was praying, God sent an angel to help him understand even more that was previously made known. However, God did not send the angel to give Daniel understanding until Daniel prayed in response to what God has already said. Mm. Are you guys with me? When Elijah prayed, even though God said the rains will fall, the rain did not fall and the drought did not end until Elijah prayed. Until El but Elijah couldn't pray unless he heard what God has said. And I'm going to touch tonight a little bit deeper. Let me just tell you this. A child, when they find out a child has hearing problems, the, or speaking problems when a child doesn't have the ability to articulate or speak the first thing they look at is not the mouth or anything in the throat or vocal cords the first thing they look at is hearing which means that if the child cannot speak there must be something wrong with his hearing Christians cannot speak or live a successful Christian life because there's something wrong with their hearing. Once you fix your hearing, hearing the voice of God keenly, you'll have the ability to use your stoma to fight a battle that you are in today, specifically for this situation or a moment or an event that you're going through right now. Stand to your feet for me, stand to your feet for me. Let's raise your hands to the Lord, church. Raise your hands to the Lord. Father, may the anointing and the Spirit of God come upon their lives. May Rhema become a part and even tonight as we carry on and we go into the voice of God and the voice of Jezebel. May every situation and every form and every effect that the enemy has on their lives in this area be broken off. May there be liberty and freedom and success in their lives and every word and promise that you've spoken to them come into fulfillment in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Come on, let's give him a praise offering.